Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and I welcome you to another 4 p.m. Uh, afternoon webcast. Today, we'll provide you with a brief macro overview, and of course, we will address your questions at the tail end of the call. Joining me, as always, is our Chief Investment Strategist and President, David Burroughs. If you have any questions, please email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the chat. Uh, we'd be pleased to address any questions that you have, and I've already had a couple roll in, in in advance, so looking forward to addressing those. And on that note, I turn the conversation to David Burroughs on this very cool, wet and rainy afternoon in Toronto, wherever this may reach you. Uh, we hope that you are settling into fall and look forward to David's broadcast this afternoon. So with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. I suppose uh, uh, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I know it feels like a cold, rainy, late October day, and from, from a weather perspective, not a great season. But, but the good news is, for those of us who spend our lives immersed in markets, uh, it's the beginning of a, of a sunnier season. Uh, it tends to be that you're through the fall uh, turmoil uh, by the time you get to the last week of October uh, or darn close to it. Uh, and uh, so we're going to talk today a little bit about some of the signs that we're seeing market-wise, where the leadership is, uh, and where we're positioning in the portfolios. But, but certainly, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a happier time when we get to the end of October. Um, what, I'm going to move quickly today. I've got lots of stuff to get through, um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the last few weeks, talk about the outlook going forward, uh, some of the signs that we see uh, that make us more bullish. Uh, as, as you know, we, we thought we'd see a little bit of sloppiness in the fall, but actually less than what would be seasonal. Uh, and it, it turns out so far that's the case. Just as always, to start from a high level, we think we started a structural bull market in U.S. equities in 2013. Along the way, other global markets have joined the party, uh, but we exceeded the highs from 2000. And it's been sort of four steps forward with one step back. Occasionally, large step back. So, you know, the end of 2018 was particularly difficult. Uh, and certainly, February, March of 2020 was pretty tough. Uh, but certainly the market has continued to find its footing and, and making new highs. Uh, from a, a fixed income or rates perspective, we do think we've been going through a bottoming process and a change in regime from a disinflationary world, which we've lived in since 1981, to a reflationary world, which is very different. Uh, things that work in rising rates tend to be quite different than those that work in falling rates. And there's been a tremendous amount of confidence built up in assets that benefit from falling interest rates because they've been the gift that kept on giving for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we think that there's lots of rotation to take place over the next few years uh, as investors recognize this regime, regime change. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the fact that we got to a point a year ago with a rolling 10-year return for the commodities index was a minus 10%, which really has only happened a few times after structural bear markets. We have had been of the belief that we've been going through a structural shift there, and that by the time it's over, you know, 10 year returns for the commodities complex, maybe six, eight, 10, 12% a year for the next 10 years. Uh, and so there's a lot of catch up that could be done there. Uh, lots of things people have been concerned about over the last few weeks. Uh, but on the other side, there have been lots of, there's been lots of liquidity, there's been a pretty good earnings outlook, uh, and there have been shock absorbers in the market that have allowed the market to absorb bad news uh, and look forward beyond some of these issues uh, and carry the market on to new highs. So here's the S&P as we saw it, uh, saw it last week. Um, we came out of this little uh, uh, corrective channel that started early September. We know that as we've gone through the course of the year, there have been rolling corrections. We had correction in technology as we went through February to March period where S&P was going higher, but tech was not. 
uh, then uh, uh, in, uh, in April, some of the reflationary sectors like financials and basic materials and industrials went into a holding pattern and traded sideways for the next four months while tech sort of carried the ball. And then there was some broad-based weakness uh, through September, October. We know that two weeks ago, we got a breadth of thrust. We had two days back to back where 95% of the volume was up volume, reaching up to buy shares. The buyers being more anxious uh, to, to put money to work. Uh, and that tends to happen at important near-term lows. Uh, and that looks to have been the case. Uh, and the market has moved on. From a breadth perspective, our breadth readings have been improving. And over the course of this week, all of our various metrics got stronger. Uh, we had uh, percent of stocks trading with positive weekly price momentum actually moved from 50% to 70% percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows moved up to 80% uh, percent of stocks trading above the 150 day moving average moved up about 10%. And actually the US bullish percent reading moved up to 59%. So 59% of stocks in uptrends, nice change across short and long-term breadth indicators means a lot of stocks showed improvement while the S&P was advancing, not just a small handful of large important companies. We like to see that because a healthy market is where more and more people, more and more uh, uh, companies are participating in the rally. Um, we talked a little bit about how we're getting into sort of the stronger period of the year as we get through October. It tends to be the case. Uh, and certainly, you know, we, we did see a nice turn uh, over the last couple of weeks. So as we sit, this week, we've put another number of days behind us. The S&P has made a new all-time high, and that's great. That could be deceiving if it were just a few large cap names, but I think that there's a, a bigger picture to tell. If we look at the S&P completion index, that's all S&P issues that are not in the S&P 500. So that's a very broad universe of companies. After trading in a range from March, consolidating the gains from early last year, we've broken out to a new all-time high. This is really important. It includes a lot of newer companies that are not included in the indices. It includes a lot of mid-cap stocks that we aren't looking at necessarily when we're looking at the S&P. And as you know, we don't own the S&P. We own a subset and our goal is to try and target the areas of strength we don't want to necessarily be crowded into all of the same names that everybody's crowded into. We'll talk a little bit about that today, but that's really, really important. It's also important that the Russell 2000 is very close to making a new all-time high, and the relative strength of the Russell 2000 has started to show improvement. Now, that's, that's also typical of this time of year. If we look at the historical Russell 2000 relative performance versus the S&P, it tends to be as we get to the end of October, we start to see relative improvement versus the largest cap stocks. And that tends to start in October and run straight through into the spring of the following year. So last week, we talked about the fact that October to April of last year were really, really good for us because it was very clear leadership and it was not difficult to target strength and avoid weakness. It looks to me as though that same kind of lift has started. We'll have to see, we'll have to continue to assess it week by week, but certainly it has happened sort of on calendar queue. From a bond perspective, we talked about the fact that the 10-year bond and frankly, the seven-year bond, the five-year bond, the three-year bond, the two-year bond uh, after rallying into August have been making a series of lower, sorry, uh, August making a series of lower highs and lower lows. If we look at the IE, uh, IEF, which is the seven to 10 year uh, treasury bond ETF, this was the little oversold bounce that we saw from March through July. And since then, <clears throat> really the bond market has rolled over and has been working its way lower. Now, I'm not calling for a fast move in higher rates, but we think that it will be a steady move to higher rates. And that has important implications as to which sectors lead the market, which ones we want to focus on. 
We don't necessarily want to own things that act like the bond market when the bond market's relatively weak. Bonds have given a negative return year to date. I think that investors in those groups may choose to say, hmm, this may be something bigger than a few month move. Perhaps I should be moving my feet, repositioning my portfolio. When we look at commodities, which has been our other big bucket, the RJI or the equally weighted Rogers Commodity Index just continues to chug higher. And this is really, really important because it's come out of a 10, sorry, a 13 year bear market. This is a group that became really under owned. The Rogers Commodities Index is made up of an equally weighted basket of commodities. We hear every day about inflation and various basic materials, whether it's rubber or copper or aluminum or agricultural products. Uh, really across the board, we've seen rising prices. Our job is to try and protect against the erosion of our investor capital. So the commodities index might be really important because really we've only just begun to reverse this very long bear market. We talked last week about the fact that the rolling 10 year returns in the early 30s got to minus 10. And as we crossed the zero line, commodity prices rose for about the next 15 years. In the same case, when the early 50s, when we crossed the zero line, went on for a long time, we've only just crossed the zero line and we're coming from a deeply oversold uh, condition in these groups. We know that many, many companies have not invested in new capacity and you just can't turn on a new copper mine or a new lithium mine. Uh, these are things that take time to develop. So let's talk a little bit about this week's data. <clears throat> we're firmly into earnings season. 144 companies as of this morning had reported of the S&P 500. Uh, sales growth has on average been 15.4% against a year ago. Now, keep in mind, we're comparing against what was a particularly difficult period of time, but that's a nice lift. Earnings growth uh, has been has averaged a little over 40%, again, over easy comparisons. What's more important probably is whether companies beat the estimates or not. So far of 144 companies reported, um, the average company beat the revenue expectation, which has been rising steadily through the year by 2%. The earnings estimate has, uh, the earnings surprise has come in at about 11%, again, from an estimate that has been rising through the year. And in general, companies have been responding favorably to the earnings. So I think there was a lot of concern coming into this earnings period as to whether inflationary or cost push might have an impact on their earnings. So far, it looks like companies have been able to pass along price increases. The question will be what analysts take away from the earnings calls and do to change their estimates for the next 12 months going forward. But 83% of companies so far have beaten the estimate. That's a very high number relative to the average. And I think that that's something we wanna to continue to watch. <clears throat> One thing that is clear is inflation continues to be a topic of conversation. And we really have to take this seriously because in our portfolios, we gotta protect ourselves. Fortunately, investors by nature have assets. Asset prices can help to, to soften the blow of inflation. Uh, but this has been a big issue. Now, interestingly, recently, uh, the mention of inflation has come down a little bit on a three-month basis. We'll see whether that continues. The big question out there is whether inflation is transitory or not. <clears throat> I talked last week about the fact that after a low, we've started to see an increase in the estimate for the next 12 months. We'll see whether that continues. That's, again, another open question. And certainly we've seen margin expectations for next year continue to go higher, meaning that the market participants believe that companies are gonna be able to continue to pass along price increases that maybe even offset more than the cost increases for their inputs. So <clears throat> we highlighted last week that the differential in price earnings multiples or valuations of growth companies is at the widest measure that it's been at going back to the year 2000. So that may help to explain, given some of the stronger data, why value or more cyclical companies have been performing a little bit better. So let's talk about some of these, some of these leading groups. Now, here's the price of oil. Uh, we talked about the fact that oil, after being sideways from 2014, briefly broke out uh, early this spring and pulled back. 
this was where it could have failed. We had all kinds of groups break out and pull back. If the reflationary trade was going to fail, it was going to fail at the end of the summer. But instead, just as the US stock market started into correction, the reflationary sector started to relatively outperform the rest of the market. And we've seen the move in oil prices. In fact, oil prices have continued to move higher. Uh, and we have the copper prices uh, you know, continuing along with it. Okay, so we talked a little bit about how copper prices uh, uh, followed through last week after speculators had taken down their positioning. We talked a little bit about uranium. Uranium prices uh, have been quite firm. And in this area, we have Cameco as one of our major holdings. Uh, this is also along the same camp as the uh, reflation, as, sorry, as the, uh, as the energy trade. I would think that it probably continues higher. Hold on just one moment. When we've gone through our structural themes over the last number of weeks and months, we've talked about the most important one being financials having come out of a range they've been in since 2008. This continued this week. The banks went on to make a new high. Much like in the energy camp, we could have failed after breaking out, uh, but in the middle of August, before the S&P started to correct, banks started to relatively outperform and have followed through. So we have lots of exposure here, but most importantly, we're starting to see the percent of stocks making 65 day highs surge. And when that happens, you tend to be getting into a much stronger move. Now we're in earnings season. Some companies have reported, some haven't. We've had a lot of strength in some of the broker dealers, asset managers and capital markets, companies like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. We know that banks and insurance companies continue to be under recommended by the street, even though they're meeting estimates nicely. We'd like to just highlight some of our key holdings. Bank of America. Bank of America reported recently on the report, broke out to a new high and now marching smartly higher, both in absolute terms and relative terms. Some of our more specialized holdings, Silicon Valley Bank Corp, this week reported blowout numbers. Stock jumped sharply already having been making new highs. When the market makes new highs, one of the things we wanna see is that our companies are making new highs with the market and in fact, leading the market. You're gonna see in a lot of these cases, the relative price strength of our stocks outperforming the S&P. In fact, Silicon Valley Bank Corp has outperformed 95% of the stocks in the S&P so far year to date, making new relative high versus the market. First Republic is similar. Uh, First Republic uh, operates in California and Oregon, Florida and New York. Uh, they have had very, very good loan growth uh, in, uh, in their commercial banking. Uh, and the estimate for this year will be a 30% earnings growth. Uh, in the NASDAQ, NASDAQ has lagged the S&P recently. It has yet to make a new high. We want to focus in the areas of strength. There are two or three core areas that are leading the S&P, the most important one is semiconductors. We talked about semiconductors being the most economically sensitive group within technology. Of course, orders can come and go. We know that there are backlogs. Uh, the semiconductor manufacturer and fabs can't make chips fast enough. In a secular bull market for demand, when we know that chips are going into everything, very difficult to have had a period of time where you couldn't build new capacity and this is clearly working its way through. Now we have representation in Broadcom, which was one of our key holdings, and in Video, which would be our largest, longest term holding in semiconductors. Uh, both are making new highs by the day. Also within technology, cybersecurity made new highs uh, on an absolute relative basis. CrowdStrike would be our biggest holding here. CrowdStrike expected to grow their earnings this year by 70%. And 2000, sorry, 2020, uh, 2022 by 70%, 2023 by another 70%. So making absolute relative highs, this is a leader in the group. Uh, and within cloud-based computing, another structural theme that we're focused in, we do own the big boys. We own Microsoft and we own Google. Google reports today. In fact, they may have reported already. I'll be very interested to see how the market responds, certainly. Uh, Microsoft acting well. Let's move back to energy for a moment. <clears throat> we talked last week about the group breaking out. Uh, oil prices continue to march higher. We made a new high today. 
And on that, on the back of that, the energy producers are making new highs, both relative and absolute. So this group continues to follow on. This has been the strongest group in the market. It's probably a higher risk area than financials, which is why we can't have the same kind of weight. When we talk about energy, we do talk about the carbon-based producers, uh, companies like Apache in the US, very steady rising relative strength versus the market. Uh, we talk about companies in Canada like Tourmaline or Arc Resources, both more a gassy uh, and Canadian Natural Resources, of other large cap, long life asset that continues to look great. I believe we've started the next leg higher in this group and likely to strengthen through the course of the winter. Uranium continues to look interesting. Lithium broke out to new highs this week. Uh, lots of companies trying to move into lithium as the global demand for battery production is going higher. And this is going to be an important group as well. <clears throat> going back to copper, copper broke out of a wedge pattern last week. Uh, so we broke out of a long base, pulled back from April until August and broke out. So our largest weight here would be Freeport, McMoran, copper and gold, similar type of price pattern, starting a new leg higher. We added this week uh, um, to our nutrient, and we also added this week to tech uh, resources. This is a great way to have exposure across the resource or commodity space, coal, copper, zinc. Uh, uh, also, um, they have the, uh, the um, uh, met coal uh, and, of course, energy. Commodities could go a long way. We talked last week about the fact that U.S. equities having a good year, but $500 billion have found their way into U.S. equity ETFs. Commodities having a far better year than equities, only six and a half billion. There are very few believers. People have become gun shy of this space because there have been several failed rallies over the last 13 years. This one to me looks like it is substantial and one that could go on for a while. And if that's the case, there is limited supply, both of companies to buy uh, and, and commodities to produce. Getting to industrials, uh, the transports continue to march higher. Nice turn in relative strength. Again, going back to before the correction in US equities, the relative performance has been improving steadily. Uh, that's in that's transports really X the airlines, more of the truckers and the shippers. Uh, also in industrial, the machinery companies, aerospace and defense, we have holdings in General Dynamics, uh, also in Textron, Bombardier here at home, you know, they have a very dominant position in business jets uh, and their order book just continues to grow. Also fitting equipment and Toromont, uh, also look quite good. Again, you can see so many of these companies have broken out of long consolidations and are starting a new leg higher, which is what gives us confidence that we could be moving out of that difficult fall period and into what could be quite a productive October to April period, which is seasonally stronger. Let's continue to move forward. Consumer discretionary had a good week this week. This is a, an interesting sector for us. We've been more cautious here. We probably need a bigger weight. We have been underweight this area. Um, we, we have been recognizing that consumer discretionary has been outperforming relative to consumer staples, offensive versus defensive consumer staples. This is a good thing. It tells us investors are more optimistic about the future. Certainly, there have been concerns about the supply chain in the auto producers. Again, another group that consolidated from spring through September, now making new highs, not probably hurt by the action in Tesla. Um, but we know that uh, while the transports have been doing well and there have been supply chain issues, container prices are starting to come down recently. So we'll see whether that continues because we do think that the supply chain bottlenecks may be resolved a little quicker than what the market expects. Maybe the market is starting to sniff that out in the autos. And we're also expressing our view on consumer discretionary with travel and leisure, which has yet to go on to make a new high, but the underlying high frequency data is improving. So the network volumes for Amex have now gone and exceeded the previous highs. So there's been a big pickup in billing, and we know that the total uh, TSA traveler throughput 
is pushing on breaking out to a new high. Likely this will happen in the holiday season, which could be good for that travel and leisure consumer discretionary space. So the key areas of momentum in the market, the key areas of improving breadth are breaking out to new highs. So our belief is that that fall correction is over. You'll see that the momentum ETF, which is a quantitatively derived portfolio is being driven largely by financials. And if you went down through them, some areas of tech like semiconductors uh, and some areas of basic materials. But again, consolidated and has broken out and started a new leg higher. I think that this could go on for some time. From an income perspective, dividend growth continues to lead high dividend payers. So this is the RDVY ETF. It's made up of companies that have had a historically better than market ability to grow their dividends. Again, after consolidating, making new high uh, and certainly outperforming high dividend. We like this much better than bond proxies and I would call bond proxies utilities telcos and consumer staples, companies that act a lot like the bond market, very predictable and low economic sensitivity. Because as we've recently pointed out, bond proxies are trading at the highest valuations they've traded at since the early 1990s. And in fact, you could go back further than that. So just to summarize, we're in a market that has broad dispersion. In other words, some sectors are acting really, really well. Other sectors are behaving very, very poorly. We've said before, 80% of return is get to the asset class that has a tailwind. And within those asset classes, find the sectors or themes that are leading. You don't have to be everywhere, avoid the stuff that isn't leading. If we look at the S&P over the period from October 15, 2020 through the 26th of October this year, okay, it's had a great return far in excess of telecom, far in excess of consumer staples, far in excess of utilities, and certainly far in excess of the bond market. But on the other side, cybersecurity, dividend growth, semiconductors, auto, travel and leisure, the overall commodity sector, uh, investment banks and asset managers, energy producers and uranium are the out, outliers. If we can target these relative performers and all of these are showing good relative price performance coming out of this correction, it should make a significant difference versus the indices. Now our portfolios, some of them are income oriented and you can't compare those to the S&P. You can compare those to the bond market or high dividend paying common stocks we are differentiated there by focusing on dividend growth. Our equity portfolios are go anywhere. We have far more Canada now than we have in a long time because of the sector exposures that are working. Uh, and in our macro portfolios, which are long, short, and be in any asset class, we do have a very sizable commodity exposure currently. And we have a short exposure to the bond market, which we think is likely to be difficult for quite some time. If we look at our exposures across the firm, by far our biggest weights continue to be financials. What I've done here on this chart this week is to show what changed over the course of the last week. Uh, and you'll see a few changes. Certainly financials continue to be our largest weight. Tech is roughly the same, slightly larger. Our energy weight is about the same, but it's three to four times the weight of the index. Industrials have come up over the course of the week because we're seeing an acceleration in some of the machinery stocks. On the other side, bond market continues to be sloppy. We've taken down our exposure to government bonds, which is already reasonably low. And really the only reason we have a bond position is in our balanced account, we have to have some bond exposure. Communication services or telecom along with Companies like Facebook and Snap and Twitter makes up only 2% versus 11% of the index. Uh, and you can see our healthcare weight is an exceedingly low weight. So healthcare, communication services, utilities, and staples make up 
a significant underweight in the portfolio, we think this makes a big difference ultimately in the returns going forward. So we're at another new all-time high. In fact, the S&P has made 56 new all-time highs this year. And here's the hard part. Every time the market makes a new all-time high, the media wants to talk about how we've never been this high before. And there are lots of commentators that will say, well, then surely we must be ready for a correction. I've said many times before, when you're in a structural bull market, as we talked about at the beginning of the call today, you will tend to make many, many, many all-time highs as the market marches higher. And every one of them means that you have happy investors who are not that interested in selling their positions other than those who worry. So in the bull market of the 1950s and 60s, lots and lots of new all-time highs annually. In the 1980s and 90s, lots and lots of new all-time highs. And you can see that since 2014, 13, we've been making lots of new all-time highs. Well, structural bull markets can go on for 15 or 18 years. We're eight to nine years in. This can go on a long time. We do have an inflation issue out there. We do have to make sure that we have assets that can protect us against all of the money that's being printed in the system. And we're working hard in our portfolios to do that. We think the portfolios are differentiated. They are actively managed. They look nothing like the index. And frankly, thankfully, that's the case. So we'll watch every day for signs of new weakness. If our breadth models start to show them or we see sectoral breakdowns or our individual positions don't participate the way that they should, we'll make changes. And we will get defensive because that's been our history. But at this point, I think that if you have capital that's sitting in cash, this is the time to get it invested. Because I think the next number of months, we will see a chase. $400 billion got taken out of equities over the course of the summer. And now the markets make new highs. I don't think those folks are feeling that right. So with that, Pam, if there are any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Dave. Well, I re really appreciate you speaking to our bond positions in the balance portfolio. So we've already addressed that particular question that came in earlier. Um, I would like your thoughts on um, REITs in a potentially rising rate environment. If you could comment there, that would be appreciated. Sure. So um, look, all REITs are not the same, just like all stocks are not the same. And um, so maybe we can just take a crack at this quickly. Um, so um, if we were to look at the different areas of REITs, um, you, could, you could break them into office REITs and office REITs tend to have very long life uh, leases with not a lot of rising price. We know there is vacancy right now. And so in the absence of rising prices, you know, may look a lot like a bond. Um, you have some very good retail REITs which you know, may in fact be seeing some positive change for the better. So for instance, if I were just to put up here, you know, Simon Property Group, okay? Simon Property Group Group is really starting to lift and they have 200 of the premier retail malls uh, in, uh, in North America, largely in coastal cities. Um, they were able to make some great acquisitions as they went through the pandemic. They bought Brooks Brothers for pennies on the dollar. Uh, we'll see whether they can make money at that. Um, so it really comes down to what it is, what is it that you own? We've focused mostly for the REIT exposure that we do have in industrial REITs because industrial REITs, uh, industrial property is in high demand uh, and the pricing power is pretty strong. So we're seeing rising prices for some of those properties. But for uh, portfolios that are more office REIT, I think it's gonna be more difficult. Um, you wanna make sure that whatever it is you own has the ability due to supply and demand to, to, to uh, ask for higher rents, which could help offset inflation. 
Thanks so much, Dave. I know that we express global macro in a very unique way using ETFs. This is something that is very uh, unique to Barometer. And um, as a result, you're very familiar with a variety of ETFs out there in the market. Question here is about two specific ETFs, the EWY, which is a South Korea ETF, and the INDY, INDY the India ETF. Sure. Wondering if you would be um, able to comment on your thoughts on that space. I guess that would fall into the emerging market category. Um, well, and I'm not too sure, but I'm not sure we call we'd call India emerging market. But but um, let's let's talk about it. Um, sure. Certainly, India was one of the first global markets to make new highs. Um, you know, in February of 2020, the INDY was trading at $39. We got there by November of 2020 and broke out to new highs and have been marching higher really ever since. Uh, this is a holding in our global macro portfolio. I think it's about a three or three and a half percent weight. Um, and certainly, you know, when other markets started to consolidate, it did too, but then it broke out and it just hasn't looked back. As far as the EWY, Asia has been a little bit more difficult. As you know, there have been uh, rolling difficulties with, with, uh, with the uh, pandemic. Uh, and we did have a wait. In fact, if you were to take a look at the long-term picture here, uh, EWI broke out and started to consolidate and we got stopped out uh, at around $89. It's currently trading, you know, around $80. Uh, it's in this consolidation channel. It's really, it's like many other things, just pulled back to the breakout. We'll see whether it can get turned and I'll watch that closely. But at this point, we don't own it. I'd like to see it trade back above sort of the 150 and 200 day moving averages right now is trading below both of those and the 50 day moving average on a relative basis, kind of underperforming. Uh, uh, e, um, uh, uh, EWT is similar, although acting better. Um, this is more dominated by semiconductors. This is the Taiwan ETF. Again, we look forward to adding this back to the portfolio if it can make a turn on a relative basis. My guess is it probably will. Where we've had more, more exposure is to frontier markets. Uh, and so this is emerging markets ex-China. Uh, and certainly it's just marched higher and it's, uh, it's a significant holding for us. Thanks so much, Dave. Next question is on your thoughts uh, surrounding the seasonality on steel. So Stelco, for example. Yeah, I think that this group looks quite good. So um, if you were to take a look at a couple of names, um, uh, this is Cleveland Cliffs. Cleveland Cliffs consolidated like many of the uh, steel companies did. Uh, it broke out to new highs actually in August, consolidated through into October, made a turn and is marching higher. Uh, Stelco uh, is doing the same thing. Um, it consolidated in a similar way, held at the 150 day average and now back above the 50 day, um, I think it looks, looks great. And I think that it's still relatively early in this theme. The reason the steel companies look interesting is because the Chinese have made it clear to, that they are trying to take environmental issues seriously. They have curtailed new steel production in China, which as a result has driven the Chinese steel companies just really to supply the Chinese market. And so the North American steel companies are enjoying uh, an opportunity uh, to have to gain market share and certainly get stronger pricing. So uh, both uh, Cle you know, Cleveland Cliffs looks interesting. Uh, Stelco, which is arguably the, the cheapest producer with a blast furnace. Uh, Nucor uh, also looks quite interesting. Uh, and it's also made a similar turn. And if you were to take the whole group, the SLX, the ETF, you know, it is making a turn, but the leading stocks like Stelco, Cliffs, and uh, Nucor are acting better than the group. Thanks so much, Dave. The, the last and probably one of the most important questions I've seen come through. We all know that you have an adorable puppy named Friday. <laughs> and everyone wants to know if you're taking Friday trick-or-treating and what he's going to dress up as. Well, you know, the funny thing is that we took him to the costume store there. Now, my dog started out, he was supposed to be 40 pounds. Turns out he's about 90 pounds. So he's a bit of a beast. Uh, we decided we wanted to try and get him some bat wings. 
And they said, oh, yes, we have bat wings. We went to the store and they said, no, no, we don't have bat wings for a dog that big. So I don't know. We're not sure we're going to have a costume for them. We'll see. Well, that's uh, sweet. I hope that you guys do have a great Halloween. And Dave, as always, uh, I will leave you with the final word. Well, if it's trick or treat, let's go for the treats. Uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's think and hope that we're into some seasonal strength here. It looks certainly from the charts that we are. Uh, we'll see how the revisions come through after earnings are reported. Uh, but so far, uh, things seem to look quite good. I'm interested to know uh, how the market is responding to Google's uh, earnings. And it looks like it's about flat after earnings. So we'll see what happens after the call. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And if you've got questions, don't hesitate to reach out directly. Uh, if you are a client and would like to have a direct uh, review, you know, happy to jump on the phone at any point in time. We're doing a lot of those right now. And, uh, and if you're not a client, we'd love you to be one. So thanks for joining us today and, and uh, join us again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Dave.